hello everyone and welcome to Echo Asthma Bootcamp. My name is Ashley. I'm your facilitator. I'm joined today by my coordinator Tabitha and our wonderful hub team, Dr. Meredith McCormick, Dr. Lewis Koritsky, and Andrea Jensen, certified asthma educator. Uh, we're so happy to have all of you here. Alrighty, so now is the time we can get started with our lecture for today and this will be on phenotypes of severe asthma. This, will, this lecture is presented by Dr. Kerr. So today's session is about phenotypes of severe asthma. So what is phenotyping in severe asthma? Severe asthma is not really a single disease and it's quite heterogeneous. And the concept of asthma phenotyping has really emerged to better understand the heterogeneity of severe asthma. The definition of phenotype is an observable characteristic of an organism resulting from the interaction between its genetic makeup and the environmental influences affecting it. The graph below illustrates symptoms on the y-axis and eosinophilic inflammation on the x-axis. Most asthma is concordant disease, such that as symptoms increase, eosinophilic inflammation increases, and symptom-based approach to therapy is often appropriate. These are the patients that are often seen in primary care. These are the patients that respond very well to symptom-based treatment, allowing in increasing the dose of inhaled corticosteroids to achieve adequate symptom control works well in this group. These are typically the patients that are seen in primary care clinic. However, many patients with severe asthma actually have discordance between their symptoms and their inflammation. On the y-axis, you could see uh, patients who have discordant symptoms. So these are patients who have a lot of symptoms, but may not necessarily have a lot of inflammation. Monitoring inflammation in these patients can actually allow down hydration of corticosteroids and limit the amount of medical use, medicine usage and perhaps even side effects. At the end of the x-axis, you can see inflammation predominant disease. These are patients who have tons of eosinophilic inflammation, but may not necessarily have symptoms on a daily basis, but may really only have symptoms when they have flare-ups. And monitoring inflammation in these patients can really allow targeted dosing of corticosteroids to lower the exacerbation frequency in these patients. And these are the typical patients that are seen who may have severe asthma that may be seen in a pulmonologist clinic. There are various factors that contribute to the phenotype of a severe asthma patient. First, it's the genes that somebody may be born with that ultimately get expressed in the person that determine what the airway anatomy histology will be, ultimately that determines the lung function, and finally the patient that's sitting in front of us that demonstrates the, the adequate symptoms, the comorbidities, the quality of life, or the exacerbations that the person may be having. So there's a lot of background that ultimately determines who the patient is and what kind of asthma that they demonstrate. There are various asthma phenotypes that have been described, some better understood than others. One of the most common phenotype is, is childhood onset asthma. This is the typical garden variety. Patients get asthma uh, when they're a child, they have a strong family history, they have a lot of atopy. Next is the adult onset. This can be both atopic and non-atopic asthma. Then there's a subclass of asthma patients who have sensitivity to aspirin or they have aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. And then there's this newer category called asthmatic granulomatosis that was recently identified a few years ago out of the University of Pittsburgh where patients who had pretty uncontrolled asthma unconventionally ended up getting lung biopsies and were noted to have granulomas on the lung biopsies. They also tend to have typical findings of asthma on the lung biopsy. In addition, a lot of them had strong family history of autoimmune disease. Again, it's a newer phenotype that we're still trying to understand. Then based on the cellular inflammation, phenotypes can be divided into eosinophilic inflammation, neutrophilic, a combination or mixed, and then those with non-inflammatory asthma or posigranulocytic asthma. Then based on the clinical characteristics, these are not necessarily typical phenotypes, but these are patients that we've all sort of met in our practice at some point. There are patients who need tons of steroids and demonstrate some sort of glucocorticoid resistance. There are patients who are doing fine between their exacerbations, but really frequently exacerbate a lot. There are some patients who really have developed asthma only as they have gained weight or obesity related. 
There are some patients who have pretty mild asthma, but really have symptoms only when they exercise or exert themselves. And then a subset of women who develop asthma once they hit menopause or after menopause. Like I said, some of these phenotypes are a little bit better understood. A lot of this information has come out of the SARP, or the Severe Asthma Research Program, which took a cluster of patients who had difficult to control a severe asthma and try and understand their characteristics and group them according to their characteristics or, or the phenotypes. And these are the three relatively better understood asthma phenotypes. The allergic asthma phenotype, these patients typically have early onset of asthma, perhaps in childhood or as teens. They have, they have a lot of allergies. They often have seasonal variations in their symptoms. They may get worse in the spring or the fall. And that's when they end up with symptoms. That's when they end up with exacerbations. And they often demonstrate a strong family history. The next is eosinophilic asthma. These are patients, they have two pronged types of asthma. One is when they have early onset, these people have allergies, they may have a high immunoglobulin E level. And there's late onset eosinophilic asthma. These typically demonstrate eosinophilic inflammation. These people typically tend to have a lot of comorbidities, sinus disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, being overweight, tend to be more women. They may also have aspirin sensitivity. They are high healthcare utilizers. They have frequent exacerbation, emergency room visits, urgent care visits, hospitalizations. And some of these may even need to stay on oral corticosteroids for maintenance therapy long-term. And then the last is the subset of neutrophilic asthma. This is typically late onset. Unlike allergic and eosinophilic asthma, the triggers for neutrophilic asthma typically are infections, sinus disease, um, this can be viral or bacterial infections, exposure to smoke, exposure to occupational uh, sensitizers or pollutants. These people tend to have lower lung function and tend to be less responsive to inhaled corticosteroids compared to the allergic or eosinophilic asthma. They, do, they tend to produce a lot of mucus and may even have bronchiectasis associated with it. So these are patients who behave more like COPD patients. There's a phenotype of mixed and a mixed eosinophilic and neutrophilic inflammation. This is not quite common and will often have overlap clinical features of both types of uh, phenotypes. The non-inflammatory asthma, posigranulocytic asthma, these tend to have a lot of smooth muscle hypertrophy, airway remodeling, and hyperplasia. They may also have fixed or variable obstruction on pulmonary function tests. There are patients with fixed obstruction. Again, these are patients like COPD. They don't have a lot of reversibility on their pulmonary function tests. And there is a lot of speculation about who these people are. Are these people who've had a history of smoking? Are these people who've had severe asthma as a child and have just gone untreated for a long time? Are these people who are behaving more like bronchiectasis with a lot of mucus production, a lot of secretions? We don't quite understand. And there's this concept of um, phenotype of hyper-responsive or variable obstruction. These tend to have a lot of bronchial provocation um, that they, their airways get irritated, whether it's a virus, whether it's an occupational exposure or a sensitizer. A lot of these patients have type 2 inflammation, but really can be seen in any type of inflammation. And these are, four of these are the much less understood asthma phenotypes that are out there. So why am I giving you all this information? Why is it important to understand what the phenotype is for your patient? So we should really be able to recognize our patient's phenotype based on history, based on understanding what their asthma is like, what their triggers are. And hopefully that should allow us to take a peek inside at what's going on at a cellular level in, in their body or understanding what their pathobiology is that, that's ultimately leading to the asthma or what their endotype is. And once we understand this, the next step would be to really identify what is an appropriate treatment to manage that patient's asthma. This relationship between the phenotype and the endotype, unfortunately, is not linear and not predictable. And so that's why the role of a biomarker has, has risen. Biomarkers allows us to understand what, if for a particular phenotype, what is going on at a cellular level, what kind of inflammation may be occurring in the patient's body. And biomarkers also allow us to target appropriate treatments personalized to their type of inflammation. Thank you for listening, and we'll open this up for some question and answers. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kerr.
So I'd like to open this up to our hub team for their key takeaways from this lecture. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I think that that was a great overview. And I think all of us, when we're taking care of the patients in front of us, maybe naturally start to categorize people into phenotypes. And maybe they're a little bit coarser than all of the ones that we, we just heard about. But thinking about the ways that we can organize our thinking to construct phenotypes and align them with the patient in front of us. And then as we go through the course, we'll think about endotypes and how biomarkers can, can also help try to define how we think about our patients and then ultimately think about treatments and approaches to caring for them. I'll, I'll open it up to my colleagues. So Louis Karitsky here. I, I think the evolution into descriptive phenotypes reflects the recognition of unmet need when we have syndromes that are fully controlled successfully, routinely, we don't look for further differentiation. I think this is a, an evolutionary step that reminds us that some of our patients are being overtreated in an effort to control problematic issues in their life, reflecting lack of uh, poor, poor asthma control. Others are taking medicines that have unwanted toxicities. And as we recognize that one size fits, does not fit all, we learn, need to learn why, because we be, initially begin describing asthma as a single pathophysiology, and then we try to fit the treatments to, to fit that pathophysiology. And as we recognize more and more, as our speaker said, that asthma is not one disease, it's a pathway of symptoms reflecting multiple different underlying pathophysiologies, then we start to look further for how we can better address those pathophysiologies. So at the same time as we celebrate our new classes of treatments and new recognition of the phenotypes, I don't see an eradication of asthma and its consequences on the horizon. I see right at our footsteps, however, the opportunity to serve patients whose regimens were overly complex or toxic before by recognizing these phenotypes we had not previously identified. Yes, I, I love that. And I love both of your comments. And I think for me, it's really important to go back to the beginning when I'm doing my asthma home visit program and I'm thinking, okay, let's rule out and make sure that there aren't some environmental things that are constantly triggering them. And so um, I'm quite anxious to get back to doing home visits. Right now we're doing them virtually. And really that sniff test, when I walk in and I can smell pet urine and I can smell mold and mildew and, and someone smoking and um, it's really interesting to see some of the environments that the people live in. And I know that in the doctor's office, you're just seeing them in front of you or you're seeing them virtually. But uh, when I get to see what's really encompassing, you know, 24 hours a day where they're living, and I can see that that's where a lot of the asthma problems are coming from. So that's always my take. Let's go way back to the beginning. Let's knock out all the environmental triggers. Let's figure out if that's what's causing problems. If they're still uncontrolled and they're fitting in one of these categories, then how does treatment need to be changed? So thank you for both of your input. Thank you all very much. Um, I'd also like to pose to, unless we have any pointed questions from the group, uh, I would like to ask our hub team if they have any questions for you um, about you know, potentially how you use phenotypes in your practice. I'd be curious from the group about what types of questions you might ask a new patient to try to start to sort out um, where they might fall in terms of phenotypes, even before you have any data from lab work, for example, or uh, pulmonary function or imaging. If anybody has some questions they find very helpful or um, one of those early questions that you like to start with just to set the stage. And feel free to just take yourself right off of mute, um, raise your hand, write it in the chat, whatever you'd like. Do you mind repeating the question again? Sure. I was just curious what people like to ask 
sort of at the beginning of an encounter for a new patient with asthma, what are your first few questions to get to know the patient and maybe that start helping you to think about what phenotype they might be um, aligned with? While we're waiting for a response from our colleagues, Dr. McCormick, I, I think your question actually prompts my interest in someone creating a, a checklist for how clinicians might better address those questions. Because I don't, I think I've seen lots of literature where people discuss in prose the different issues like did they have childhood asthma, are there smokers in their home, all sorts of factors that would help you to tease out. But I don't see that anybody's put together a simple questionnaire like we have to look at asthma control, for instance, about how, how many times do you awaken at night or is your exercise interrupted by the need for, in, for a bronchodilator? Is, is there any such document that you know of that you think is a concise check the box questionnaire so that maybe I've had an asthmatic that I've been seeing for more than 10 years and this knowledge was not available 10 years ago. So I had no reason to ask them all the questions that would be per pertinent to phenotyping today, I don't think I have as a primary care clinician, a single checklist that would help me to say, all right, I wanna really go through the questions that would best help me identify which phenotype should I be considering? I think you point out a, a, an interesting gap. I don't think there is that exact resource that you're talking about, which uh, you know might be a real advance. Sarah Hooper talked about a history of allergens, pets, and smoking. And I think that gets to some of the points that Andrew was making, things that we learn about the home environment, maybe questions to try to create that construct of what, what does your home environment look like or, or your work environment or areas where you spend a lot of time. And she also mentioned how long a patient's had asthma or, or what are their triggers. We also ask about history of infection, you know, respiratory infection. In our clinic, it's mostly pediatrics. And so that includes RSV infections, frequency of infections, um, eczema, you know, dermatitis issues. Those are great points. Even though I see adults in my practice, I always ask, uh, all of my new patients about their early life history and going back to birth, whether they're born on time or had anything that severe pneumonia or anything that was notable in the first couple years of life. And then I go on to elementary school age. And I, I kind of set the stage that I ask everyone this and um, just so that uh, we start with the beginning. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Sarah. I actually also, this aligns a little bit with the lecture. I often ask patients if they've ever been treated with prednisone. And then I just ask what happens when they are treated with prednisone, because sometimes um, patients will just say, you know, it's like I don't have asthma or it all melts away, or I can go from you know, feeling like I need to go to the emergency room to back to normal in two days. And to me, that um, really provides a lot of, of insight. I think that's a great point. And then we know that we have those patients that don't respond to uh, steroids and steroid resistant. And that was my son, the one that was in the ICU so many times, he'd be on 60 milligrams a day and still end up in the, in the ER and in the ICU. So it's, it's interesting how you have to drill down on there's so many different components. It's a wonder we're able to help so many people as well as we can because there's so much going on. You know, I'm hearkening back to the phrase about the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree. In the ADHD literature, there was a study that surprised me, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, there was a study that surprised me. They enrolled children uh, to do an ADHD study. And as part of the children's evaluation, they also did interviews on the parents. And they discovered a, a not insubstantial number of parents who never recognized that they fit the formal criteria for ADHD themselves. And as I listen to our discussion now, I can't help but wonder how many of our asthmatic patients that we're taking care of as children and young adults have parents who have dealt with the burden of asthma symptoms and never received an appropriate diagnosis. So they may never have even known or, or had their symptoms well enough addressed to remove those burdens from their life. Is there good literature on that, uh, Andrea or, or Dr. McCormick? I don't know. 
Well, I'm not sure, but I can tell you personally, that's exactly what happened to me. My, um, the middle son, the problem one <laughs> that was in ICU all the time, when he was diagnosed with asthma and I started learning more about asthma, this is back in 2000, I started to look at everything and go, wait a minute, that sounds like me. And so, uh, yeah, so did the spirometry test. So I was well into my 30s before I was ever diagnosed. And then looking back at my childhood, I mean, I grew up in the you know, 70s and they didn't really didn't treat asthma back then. And so looking back, I think, oh, that's what that was. And so, and then I'm talking to all my siblings who are older than me and they're, ah, I'm fine. I'm like, every time I talk to you on the phone, you're coughing. And so really, yeah, you're right. Looking back and seeing if there's that familial trait that's going on, it, it's pretty interesting. And we've come so far in asthma, which I'm so grateful for. I also think it's wise to, to incorporate family history live, even if you can, because the story we hear from the person who shares a bedroom or as a family member, and they say, well, all right, well, how come you, you stop playing tennis now because you would get shorter breath? You say you don't wake up, but I hear you cough three times a night and then you get up and go to the bathroom or rinse your mouth. And, and sometimes the family member gives you critical history that the patient has either in denial or frankly just doesn't recognize. So I think that family picture can be quite valuable. Right, I agree. And I was helping a, a set of twins and the mom noticed that one twin was a lot less active than the other one and would slow down and wasn't able to keep up with the other one. And sure enough, that was the one that ended up having asthma. So yeah, it's amazing all the clues that you can pick up on. Hi, Sandra. Oh, yep. Yep, we'll send. We'll make sure that you at the end of each session, we um, we clean up the recording and then we send it out via email to everyone who joined us today. So don't worry, we will make sure that uh, that you get that. Uh, she might have actually just left. <laughs> um, so I'll be sure to cut this portion out of the video. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Do we have any other um, any other questions or uh, comments? One more comment in my daily flag banner carrying about smoking. Everyone in my entire family has paid a consequence for smoking. My mother died at 63, lung cancer. My father at 52 from his first and last MI, smoking. My older brother, lung cancer. My younger brother, multiple MI. My youngest brother, hematologic malignancy associated with smoking. When you do your history about smoking in the home as you try to protect the person who's victimized by asthma. Please do not accept the statement, oh, well, I only smoke outside. Every one of us who's a clinician has probably had the experience multiple times of a person who comes to our office, they're certainly not smoking in the office, but after they leave the examining room, there is so much residual of the odor and the remnants of the tobacco in the air, we can't even put a patient in there for another half hour or hour, perhaps even the rest of the day, there's so much in the air. I show parents who say they only smoke outside an article that looked at cotinine levels. Cotinine is a metabolite of nicotine, but it's more like the A1C of diabetes. Your nicotine levels zoom up and down with every cigarette. Cotinine gives you an average smoking over several weeks period. When a parent says to me, I only smoke outside, that tells me that their heart's in the right place. They're trying to protect their child. They think they're doing enough. So I show them the data that says, even well-intended parents who say they only smoke outside, their children's cotinine levels is five times as high as people who live in a non-smoking home. And that also gives me a handle. There's a lot of parents who would not quit smoking for their own benefit because they think, well, they will never harm me, or you know, I'm not gonna bother, it's too hard. But once I put down on the table that by them continuing to smoke, even if they smoke outside, it could be damaging their child, that's a lot stronger pull and a motivation for them to change behavior. For those who might not have stopped, thought of stopping smoking before, this is a very strong push to get them onto the right track. Thank you, Dr. Kurtzke. You don't remember the reference on that, do you? Could you say that again? You, um, 
Dr. Kritsky, do you remember the reference on that article? I'll look it up while we speak. Okay, thanks. And I think it's fascinating um, to have something like a decision tool, it sounds like what you're describing, Dr. Kritsky, for, uh, for phenotyping. Um, that's something that we should definitely all look into, see if it's available. Um, so, uh, Rebecca, just I know that we got that form out to you really late. Um, are you able to present today? Otherwise, we have a backup. Um, so I could I could do it verbally. I wasn't okay. didn't really know how to navigate the uh, the online Template. form. Oh, that's yeah. okay. That's okay. So, and and this case is evolving. I was looking for one that was was an adult. So this is an eighteen. Hang on, just a second. This is a young man that I saw for the first time last week who came to me with an asthma exacerbation. He's 18 years old. He's had asthma since he was an infant after an RSV infection. Um, but he came to, to our practice in 2019, um, but I saw him for the first time last week. He told me that he uses Advair, um, one Advair Discus um, 250, one puff twice a day. Um, he uses, he's on Montelukast 10 milligrams once a day, Cetirzine 10 milligrams once a day. And he also told me that since January, he'd been on prednisone um, 20 milligrams twice a day. Um, in conversation this week with his mom, she was unaware of that, but she's a traveling nurse and he manages his own medicine. So we discussed, um, you know, some of the issues pertinent to that. Um, he had some allergy testing. Um, it, allergies is one of his triggers um, for asthma. Um, he had, and I'm learned just learning how to interpret some of these. So. He was definitely had, so, so he had the immunocap testing um, as well as um, hypersensitivity um, pneumonitis panel. So um, in terms of allergies, dog dander and cat dander were high on, um, on the immunocap. Um, he did, he has done more poorly since he um, adopted a, a dog a year ago. Um, he had some positives on the Aspergillus um, alternaria and the um, Cladosporum. Tests, and I'm not a little unclear in terms of the um, Aspergillus index, the precipitin was non-detected. So I don't know, maybe you guys can help out with that. Um, so my question was, is he, is this a medication compliance issue? Is this, uh, is he truly on 40 milligrams of prednisone twice a day? And if so, um, how do we test him for biomarkers going forward? And how long does he need to be off the prednisone before we can actually move forward with that? Um, if we were gonna think of a biologic for him. Thank you so much, Rebecca. This is such a great case. Thanks for presenting this. I have a few questions, but I wanna allow the group to ask their questions first. I'm just going to give everybody another minute or so in case any of our learners or participants also want to chime in with questions. I forgot to add um, that his body habitus is um, morbidly obese. So I don't know if that contributes. He had a chest x-ray um, a couple years ago that showed mild central um, bronchial wall thickening with mild hyperinflation. He had a spirometry test in 2019 that um, 
was within normal limits. Um, a few months prior to that, he had a complete pulmonary function test that showed um, um, normal FEV1 and FEC with an, a reduced FEV1 um, FEC ratio with significant 24% um, improvement um, after bronchodilator. Um, he was on our annuity in Monte Lucast at the time and diffusion was normal. His weight is 86 kilograms. I had a couple questions about his, the symptoms that he has that he's been, you know, treating um, with any medication and in particular with the prednisone recently, uh, like what prednisone made better. And then also his history prior to January of being on prednisone, if you know any of those things. It's a little sketchy because he doesn't come in very often. And I'm wondering if his mom is getting um, his medicine as samples at work because she's a nurse practitioner. Um, I don't know the family well enough to have gotten into that um, because we're certainly, we're certainly not providing, he's <clears throat> in terms of refills, he hasn't, he hasn't been getting refills from us enough to be on it on a daily basis because he's he comes in about twice a year um which yeah which is not what we had recommended um so in terms let me let me sort out your first question so in terms of symptoms um when i spoke with the mom this week she said that he was so short of breath that he was sitting up in bed um to sleep um, so he also has significant snoring, which brings to the table in the differential would be some um, obstructive sleep apnea versus asthma. It's a sleep study has been discussed, but not done. He has significant shortness of breath on exertion, wheezing, dry cough. Did I miss anything? Nope. Did he, does he, um, is he able to walk around his home or uh, does he go out of the house to go to school or work or those types of things? He um, is doing virtual learning right now for school. And I don't know the answer to the other questions. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get the video to work and it was a virtual visit. So I didn't, I couldn't observe what was going on. I had my clinic on Wednesday, uh, uh, which is just yesterday, but it feels like a long time ago now. And it, there were a lot of virtual to phone to chaotic visits. So um, yeah. sometimes, yeah, you just get what you can, right? And then- right. Do you, th do you think he's ever been to the emergency room or been intubated or like, do you, did you have a sense of that type of kind of almost life-threatening asthma in the past? He's been hospitalized. I didn't catch whether he had been intubated. His last hospitalization, I think was three years ago. And then I have a couple other just I'm sure there's more to delve into with his history, but in terms of just data, do you have a total IgE on him? And I'm thinking about ABPA and whether that is part of the possible um, diagnoses. And so you have, it sounds like the chest x-ray had some bronchial wall thickening. So that could be bronchiectasis. He has positive I think RAS testing, you said, to two mold slash fungi, aspergillus and cladosporium. And then um, IgE over a thousand is, you'll see that classically as your ABPA criteria. But I will say like where, where I work, our units are different. So for us, it's over 440 um, when you kind of do the math. So just if you're looking at criteria for ABPA, um, you can just double check the units to make sure that when you're looking at whether you meet those criteria, if you're looking it up, say in a textbook or online, just make sure your units are the same um, or double check the units. 
Okay, so his his um, IGE was 201. Um, is that um, that's elevated? It's K, it KU per liter. I'm not so. I don't. Even, I always have to check. So it's probably below the like you know the the. It's red as normal. Yeah, uh, threshold, but yeah. Okay, what was your cutoff that you mentioned a minute ago? It's either a thousand or another, if you, in a different unit, it can be about 440. And I forget which the two units are, but often in like a textbook, you'll see over a thousand, but, but you should just make sure that. Check you know, the units. Okay. Yeah. yeah. His, um, his, yeah, the IGE was normal. His eosinophil count was, this was a little, I'm not, I'd love your clarification on how to interpret eosinophils, but um, on one occasion in 2019, his eosinophil count was, the absolute eosinophil count was 0 0.05, which was marked as low, but it had in 2004, it had been um, 0 0.62, which would have been elevated. Um, so it made me wonder, had he been on prednisone or something prior to uh, to that, that reduced his eosinophils? Anyway, I would be what interested in right? repeating that. Oh, sorry. I would be interested in repeating that, but I didn't know how long he needed to be off prednisone. So I was just gonna comment what you're doing right now, it, like on, on screen in front of everyone, is what I do a lot of times during an office visit, especially with a new person where you don't have the time to align, like going back through their history of prednisone or through your chart. What I'll do is if I have electronic health record or even a chart, just try to look at their history of eosinophilia, knowing that I'm not gonna know which is in the context of prednisone or which isn't. So if I see any instances of elevation, I think, well, they have some kind of um, you know, predisposition to have eosinophilia. And so you're, you gave numbers that we can multiply by a thousand. So it sounds, and if you think right. about sort of the lowest threshold for the biologics, for example, which would be a way to think about just from a therapeutic standpoint, you know, significant, clinically significant eosinophilia, because it's significant to the extent that they would meet an indication for biologic if, if you're on that track. So 150 is the, the threshold for the biologics or 300. And so your first number of 0 0.05 multiplied by a thousand would be 50 absolute mm -hmm. eosinophil count. And then the one from 2004 was 0 0.62. So that would be 620. Mm -hmm. So 620 is certainly elevated, like however, however you slice it. Um, and the 50 isn't so elevated, but as you say, we don't know that could have been in the context of prednisone. And right now, if, if we can get him off of prednisone, then we can look at the eosinophil count off of prednisone. But since he's been on it since January, that's not gonna be something we can do overnight. Um, and so I still would check it now because if he has some eosinophilia now in the context of having had all of this prednisone, that would really suggest that you, he has a pretty strong eosinophilia drive. Oh, okay, that makes that's helpful, yeah. Thank you. So maybe some other, we could think about what, what else to do for him, but uh, I also want to hear from others. I don't want to dominate the conversation. I want to make sure other people have a chance to chime in. You know, I'm wondering too about uh, what medications he's on, on the Advair. Is he really taking it and is he just using a sample and how many doses are in his sample? And so is he just using that here and there, is that explaining why he's on so much prednisone? And I'd love to see his inhaler technique. We know that, what is it, well, probably 90% use their inhaler incorrectly. And, and would it help if he used a spacer with it? Would that help his inhaler technique? And then I'm wondering um, if he's got some air trapping and, and kind of that barrel chest with what's going on with some of his symptoms as well. But yeah, I'd really like to go back to the basics. And I'm trying to find, uh, I'd love to share this with the group, but um, John Hopkins had, 
a um, Dr. Arlene Butts, lead nurse scientist, Asthma Express. You probably know her. Um, she has this terrific graphic and it shows one course of oral uh, prednisone delivers five times the amount of sterile um, steroid medication. So I have this graphic saved and I'm trying to figure out how to upload it. I may have to just send it to Ashley and have her share that with the group, but um, it shows a little red line just at the bottom of this little girl's dress, a little stripe, and that's how much medicine is in her body. And then it shows the little girl that's on prednisone and the whole dress is full of, um, of medication. So really getting them to understand the difference between, um, you know, the micrograms and, 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 you know, the difference with the medication. And people always think that, you know, I'm just going to take a five-day dose or whatever prednisone, and they don't understand that it's so much less if you're just taking the Simbacort and he's taking that consistently and he has the right inhaler technique and it's actually getting into his lungs. And so um, I'll try to figure out how to send that. So keep going with that. Yeah, feel free to just send it right to me and then I'll share. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I, I just sent the uh, reference on smoking exposure by parents who smoke outside the house to everyone. But I also, as we talk about trying to escape the toxicities of systemic steroids, I can enclose the reference if you like. There's a 16 year follow-up of children who attended an asthma camp. And in that population, uh, the ultimate attained adult height was half an inch lower in children who used the inhaled steroids, especially at the higher doses. Now, I don't know how important a half inch is. I know you only see the top of me. I'm six feet, nine inches tall. In my family, people grow a half an inch overnight in the crib. But for other families who are, are, are not so growth hormone productive, for some families, it really does make a difference. And so I, I want to respect parents who say, uh, come on, you know, I've heard that steroids can affect growth. And is there not a reason why I could try a leukotriene antagonist or maybe control my child's allergies better or limit some of the environment if there was a way I could either eliminate or reduce even inhaled steroids. And I don't mean this in any way to disrespect what my colleagues have said about how simple it seems to swallow a small tablet and that people don't recognize just how large a dose that is. But at the same time, I'm, I'm still very vigilant about making sure that parents understand there is no free lunch in asthma. Any treatment you have that's going to potentially benefits you can also have downstream toxicity. I want you to be clear on what the benefits you can attain are and what the potential risks are also are. I'm glad you mentioned that, Dr. Um, Karitsky, because that actually is something that the patient had verbalized a year or so ago as to one of the reasons why he didn't like to use his ad bearer because he didn't want it to interfere with his height growth. And I just put the uh, reference from New England Journal about that asthma camp experience by uh, Kelly. Uh, you'll notice the, the issue about the asthma and smoking was from uh, 1997, but I don't think the information is any less pertinent today than it was then. Even though we have much to celebrate, in 2020, we have the lowest incidence of smoking in adults in the history of recorded smoking in America, down to 14%. So that's something to celebrate. But unfortunately, some of our highest risk patients for asthma in, in some of the lesser resourced communities are also the ones who are smoking more. Another thing I would, uh, we should make sure not to overlook in this patient who's 18 is whether or not he started vaping or any electronic tobacco. Um, those can really um, be huge triggers. And um, in some cases, I've had some really extraordinary uh, cases where it's, um, taken people from uh, very well-controlled mild asthma to severe asthma. Um, and so that's something to ask about in the history. I would say that for this patient, um, to me, one of the things, just like a, the takeaway I would have, I think if I were in the room, would be that this is like someone you're in, in deep for the long haul in terms of like un, unpacking all of um, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And I would say, a, a first goal I would think would be to just um, set up an alliance as far as um, communicating what medications he's taking, how he's taking them with him and his mom. And that like, this isn't something that you're gonna be able to solve in a week or a day. And it sounds like he's been on 
oral steroids since January. So one would just be to make sure he's safe, that if he's sleeping up upright and close to an exacerbation, that they, you know, sort of have a plan of when he would go to a hospital or go to an emergency department um, to make sure that you're safe in the here and now. And then maybe the second would be to try to, in a follow-up visit, since you were like on the phone and not in video, you know, th there, it sounds like there are a lot of logistical things to maybe set up a follow-up to, to review everything and maybe kind of set the table for environmental, you know, what are his environmental factors, be it re revisiting um, whether he has any habits like vaping or the new dog or other exposures, like does the dog sleep with him, you know, things like that. And then um, like Andrew is getting to the medications, like maybe he doesn't like the dry powder inhaler. If he's ever been on um, a canister, uh, HFA instead, you know, would that be something he, you know, if he's not using the dry powder inhaler regularly, would he like to try that? And then maybe if things are looking stable, you could try to kind of walk down the prednisone at the next time. But if not, I would say just leave it until you can kind of set up the, the trust and really, you know, fill in some of the gaps so that you can make a longer term plan. Someone put in the chat, Sarah Hooper did about peak flow. And this is definitely someone who you might try to get some more objective data. So I think a peak flow would be a good tool. Um, and I think it's a good idea. Really checking eosinophil count now um, and just some labs now would be um, a good uh, just to figure out, just get some data now and maybe lung function now um, so that you can have some objective data to, to follow um, as I, you know, the plan would be to try to take away the steroids if you think he's well enough controlled. And then you could follow eosinophil count um, to see if that flares and tracks. Um, and besides, then you also... besides a CBC, would you do anything else? CBC with diff? Uh, I think since you have the RAS testing, which is in the last couple of years, um, I might check a total IgE to see where that is now. Um, I don't think you need to repeat the RAS because it doesn't typically change. It changes more in kids, which, uh, but, but probably not on the order of the time scale you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I didn't recall the names of the allergens that our colleague mentioned, but one thing that has changed within this young man's lifetime is kids don't want to go to the doctors and teenagers, they'd rather do almost anything than to go to see a healthcare professional. So fortunately, we now have the availability of oral home desensitization for a number of grasses and house dust in particular. And I don't know any asthmatic who has an IgE that's that big that doesn't likely have a house, dose com house dust component to their allergy profile. So I think it would be worth revisiting that, especially because this young man can know that it can happen at home. And if any of the grasses he has are seasonal, there are five grasses that are now approved for home desensitization. It's, it's pricey. So I, we did, I don't know anything about this young man's resources or those of his family, but for some, the deal of having to drive to the doctor and park and pay for the medicine and pay for the parking and get off of school and whatever else is necessary to make this happen to get allergy shots, the freedom of doing it at home is the deal maker instead of the deal breaker. Thank you. You know, I wanted to follow up with uh, his concern about growth because I hear that quite a bit from parents. And so I carry pictures of kids on my phone. So while I'm doing a virtual visit, I'll just hold up the picture of my um, two oldest sons. One's 30, one's 26. The 30 year old, the oldest one is the one in our family with the most mild asthma. Um, and he's been on the least amount of ICS over the years. And uh, he's about uh, six inches shorter. Um, then my son that had the severe asthma was on all the medication, all everything over the years was in ICU all the time. He, yeah, so he's about eight inches taller. So I tell people this kid had a lot more medicine in his body and, and, you, and they can see the clear height difference. Um, and the studies show it's about um, a centimeter difference in growth. Um, also studies have shown that um, if he's not sleeping well, that's going to be more of an effect on his growth. 
And oftentimes they don't realize they're not sleeping well. And then other family members, we mentioned this earlier, um, the mom will say, yeah, he, you know, he wakes me. I can hear you coughing. Your room's right above me. I can hear you coughing all night long. And they don't realize that they're not getting that deep REM sleep. And that's actually more of an impact on their growth than if they were to stay on the inhaled corticosteroids. So for what it's worth. And then, yes, I like what Meredith said about, you know, I don't know if he's on the, for the adverb, if he's on the discus or if he's on the inhaler. Yeah, he's he is on the discus and and that's a great thing to address actually does he dislike that dry powder kind of thing that happens quite a bit and a lot of people don't realize and i said you could just switch and i'll hold up the little poster from allergy and asthma network <laughs> and yeah. i'll say see that see that little purple you can get the exact same one in an inhaler so if you don't like it you can switch and and i always tell them look there's this rainbow of options here so if you don't like what you're using talk to your doctor. Let's, let's get another one. Let's get you going on that. And then I know he's at the age where he's immortal, right? Because all 18 year olds are going to live forever. And so for him, it's not going to even connect with him. If we talk about airway remodeling and how um, most likely he's going to tra transition into asthma, COPD, overlap syndrome, and he's going to be stuck on oxygen. That's not going to mean anything to him now. But if we talk to him about how it's impairing his life and can he keep up with his buddies and he can't sleep at night, he's got to sleep sitting up. Um, can he go out with his buddies to go for a walk around the block? Can he take his dog for a walk? Is he not able to do all of those things? Are, how is his quality of life suffering because he's not willing to treat his asthma on a regular basis because he thinks it's going to stunt his growth. Um, he's probably pretty close to full size now anyway at age 18. I mean, I'm sure he'll grow a little bit more, but um, really trying to figure out what his currency is and how to connect to him. If it's that he wants to be more active, he wants to be able to sleep laying down. Um, he wants to be able to date. He wants to be able to go to the soccer games on campus, whatever. Um, what is it that he can't do right now because of his asthma and, and, and how can we help him to be able to do those things? And then talking about the importance of just taking that tiny, tiny little bit of medicine every day that's not going to stun his growth. And hey, you don't like the disc, let's, let's switch it to the, to the inhaler and see if you like that. Thank you. I have one comment I'd like to put in. I know we have only a few seconds, but this has not come up in any of our other asthma conversations. Asthma, like other visible disorders, are, is a ticket of ex exclusion for some people. They use it for secondary gain. They don't take their medicine because that excuses them for, for participating in athletic activities, or they're not responsible to complete their chores around the house, or, oh, poor baby, your asthma isn't controlled, and they choose not to control. I'm not meaning to malign your patient, but I'm just saying we need to be cognizant that there are some folks who we provide the best therapy and by direct decision to not use those therapies, they want to use their disease process for secondary gain. I've not seen it often and it has, it has fooled me because I felt into the same sympathetic patch that the person's family members do, do. but I, I want to make sure that that comes on the table as part of the differential of poorly or uncontrolled asthma. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Dr. McCormick, do you want to just read out um, some some of your statements in the chat just so we have them on the video? Oh, sure. I was just mentioning I would check a hemoglobin A1C when you're sending blood work to just given the fact that the prednisone as well as his baseline um, uh, BMI and obesity. And I do think that ultimately once you're uh, trying to distill the current issues and reclassify him or update his classification in terms of current eosinophil count and the fact that he's been on prednisone, I think I would continue to consider whether biologics would be uh, a, an option and whether he's a good candidate for that. So I don't think, um, just think about adherence and, and uh, other driving factors like environmental, but um, I do think given if he's prednisone dependent now and he's been on uh, and he's had eosinophilia in the past, I think you know, he remains a potential candidate. Thank you. We can do a quick summary. So we talked about an 18 year old who has been prednisone dependent since January and has a history of intermittent eosinophilia, uh, allergy to cat and dog, and has a, a new dog in the household in the last year um, who's on ICS lava and leukotriene modifier therapy. And um, due to some lo logistics of present day, uh, we have some questions still about his adherence 
other environmental drivers, including vaping or habits. Um, and, up, and next steps are to update his uh, classification with um, further objective testing, check back in to revisit his history and, um, and consider next steps in terms of therapy. And hopefully he'll give us an update as the course goes on. I'll try, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. Um, all right, well, let's scoot on to our post-test polling questions. Question one, which of the following statements is true? An endotype is the external observable characteristic of an organism resulting from interaction between its genetic makeup and environmental influences. Or a phenotype is the external observable characteristic. And question two, which factor contributes to the phenotype of the severe asthma patient? Genetics or hereditary factors, environmental influences, inflammatory mediators, or all of the above? Okay, Dr. McCormick, how did we do? Awesome. Everybody got the answer right that the phenotype is the external observable characteristic. Uh, and for our second question, uh, everybody did great, and the answer is all of the above, that genetics, environmental, and inflammatory mediators all contribute to the phenotype of a severe asthma patient. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for answering those. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. Um, do we have any, just while I have all of you here, thank you all so much for hanging out. Do we have any volunteers for next week's case? As you can see, you know, it's great if you fill out the form. Otherwise, if you are, you know, able to present, that would be uh, wonderful as well. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful week. Echo clap. Thank you, Rebecca, once again. All righty. We'll see you all next time. Have a good one. Bye-bye.